top boxing news. Okay, we'll start with this. Word round the campfire is that Argentina's own unbeaten up-and-comer in the women's super bantamweight division, Nazarena Romero, will be taking on Lucretia Arrieta. Nazarena Romero, who's rated number one by way of the WBA. She's let it be known that she's targeting a title fight with this division's WBA champion, Magyarling Rivas of Venezuela, a matchroom fighter. That's her target for this year. One of the perks of taking on Magyarling as opposed to one of the other three champions at the weight is that Magyarling boxes on the DAZN platform, a major platform, and they don't. So before it becomes about Romero versus Rivas, Nazarena Romero must first take care of Arietta. That's the first order of business for Nazarena Romero. Nazarena, who sports a professional record, an unblemished one of 12 wins with no losses, no draws. Six knockouts. A mid-range to inside fighter, pressure fighter, volume puncher, a violent one. Only 28 years old. They have come across at least one or some of Nazarena Romero's violent knockouts here on this channel. I've used several of them in the intros. She's a big puncher. She is that, according to Hoyle, tough as old boots Argentinian slugger that packs a big punch. I've no doubts. She's going to make short work of Lucretia. Lucretia, who's coming off of two losses, two consecutive losses in her last two fights. Nazarena Romero, by way of knockout or technical knockout, is the logical choice, the logical way to go. Lucretia, she has been stopped. She has been stopped at least once already. She's got three professional losses. One among them, at least one of them, was a knockout loss. She's been stopped before, and I think she's going to get stopped again later on this month, on the 29th. Nazarena Romero ended her last two bouts, her last two contests, by way of technical knockouts. I think she's about to rack up another. When she does, she will come one step closer to taking on Magyarling Rivas, one of four active reigning world champions in the women's super bent and weight division a matchroom fighter. And a bit of an odd signing. When they initially decided to bring Magyarling on board, Magyarling, who's fought at least once under the promotional banner, I figured that they brought her on board to at some point match her against one of their unbeaten up-and-comers in the super bantamweight division. Maybe Ellie Scottney, maybe Ramla Ali. But as it turns out, Ellie Scottney's going to be taking on Shernika Johnson for her IBF title. And Ramla, I don't know how soon we can expect to see Ramla in the ring against the champion. I don't even know that her next fight... I don't know that her next fight is going to be a title fight. I don't know when her next fight is. They signed Magyarling to the promotional banner in March of last year. And that way, it's been a little over a year's time since the signing. And I'm not sure what the end game here is. Not because she isn't a good fighter and a good champion. She's all those things and more, but I don't feel like they're utilizing her as much as they could be. There are three other champions at this weight. Yemi Mercado of Mexico, who holds a WBC title. Deborah Dionysius of Argentina, who holds a WBO. Deborah is going to be in action very soon against former champion Sigalene Lafarve. Shernika Johnson of New Zealand by way of Australia. Shernika is set to take on Ali Scottney on the undercard of Taylor versus Cameron. Given that it's been a year since they signed her, a year and no unification matches at Super Bantamweight. It's a division that has remained divided for some time now. I would have thought Matchroom would have used Margetling to consolidate the alphabet titles until such a time as one of their unbeaten up-and-comers is prepared to challenge her for them. They didn't do that. I don't know what's in the cards for Margetling Rivas this year, but I know that every day that passes and every fight that Nazarena Romero wins brings her that much closer to Mayerling Rivas' WBA title. That I do know. She's already got a cushy spot in the WBA's current rank standings. And if she wins this fight with Lucretia... At some point, Mayerling is going to have to deal with her. The more professional experience she garners, the more dangerous she becomes. For now, she's set to return to action later on this month on the 29th. And like I said, I anticipate that her next fight is going to end in the same violent fashion that her last two fights ended. I think she's going to stop Lucretia, and she's made it clear she's got Magyarling Rivas in her crosshairs for this year. In men's heavyweight news, Eddie Hearn says Joshua must first return in July or August if he's getting three fights in 2023. The buildup of the Franklin fight 
For a short while after it, you heard Eddie propping up a potential Fury fight. Seems like he's pulling back on that now. Rightfully so, I'd say. Joshua is aiming to fight three times this year, which means his next outing would have to take place in the summer. A rematch with divisional rival Dillian Veidt is still a likely scenario for Joshua's next bout. Some fights are there to be made, and you get one chance to do it. Hearn told Boxing Social. I think that is the potential case with Tyson Fury. At the same time, I would still like him to have another fight with Derek James to improve on what he's been working on. Dillian Veidt is a great fight. He needs to get back in the ring in July or August at the latest if he is to get three fights in this year. Now, I happen to agree that Anthony Joshua shouldn't go for a big fight a huge one straight away that he needs more time with Derek. But I don't know how motivated he will be for a Dillian Veidt fight. Dillian Veidt, a fighter that he knocked out many years ago. Does he have any motivation or interest in knocking him out again years later? If Joshua is able to have his next fight in the summer, Hearn would stage the third bout on a date in December. I would like to see him have a little rest, then get straight back to Texas with Derek and try to have an end of the summer fight and then try to fight in December. It would be great for his career. Yeah, I think it would too. But I don't actually view Dillian Veidt as the ideal opponent choice for a summer blockbuster. I happen to think that the ideal choice in this scenario would have to be Otto Valin, who would service as a common opponent between Anthony and Tyson Fury, same way Dillian Veidt did, with the difference being that Otto Valin has never been stopped, not even by Tyson Fury. You want to send a message that you've still got it. Knocking out Dillian White again doesn't communicate that better than knocking out a guy that's never been knocked out. And you ask yourself, well, how's he supposed to knock out Otto Valin when he couldn't knock out Jermaine Franklin? That's a valid question. Was fellow content creator Bass the Kid who raised this point in one of my previous lives stating, Anthony Joshua struggles with shorter fighters. Shorter fighters of shorter stature, portly fellows like Andy Ruiz, like Jermaine Franklin, like Oleksandr Yusuf. Shorter fighters of shorter stature with a lower center of gravity, they're a bit trickier for Anthony Joshua than, say, a statuesque fighter like an Otto Valin, which would be a bigger target. Teddy Ernest said that the general feeling is Anthony Joshua needs another fight in July before jumping in with Tyson Fury or Deontay Wilder and named three possible opponents, Dillian White, who we just talked about, Otto Valin or Joe Joyce. Like I said... You could sell a Dillian White rematch, you could, but I don't know how many people are actually interested in seeing Anthony knock that guy out again. I don't know how interested Anthony is in knocking that guy out again. Otto Valin would be ideal. We'll say a Joe Joyce fight would be a hotter ticket than the two aforementioned fights, but that would be less than ideal. Could definitely sell a Joe Joyce fight in the United Kingdom, but... How long before it becomes a sides of the street kind of deal, a sides of the street kind of situation? Joe Joyce stated, he may talk about tough fights against me and Fury, but I reckon he needs to rebuild his confidence before he gets juggernauted. It's a big fight. Though not a realistic one. Am I to believe that if Anthony Joshua made Joe Joyce an offer to fight this summer, Frank would simply send him over? No way. Let's just cut the fucking crap here, all right? Irrespective of what you think of Anthony Joshua and his fighting ability or the lack thereof, he's the A-side to Joe Joyce. Why, he just sold out the O2 Arena, sold it out, in spite of what the critics and the naysayers were saying. What they were saying in the build-up. He's the A-side to Joe Joyce, where Anthony Joshua sold out the O2 Arena, Joe Joyce is fighting at the copper box on the heels of a career best win, a highlight reel knockout over Joseph Parker. He's playing a smaller venue in front of a smaller audience. Shouldn't be no haggling situation between these two. There would be, because Frank Warren isn't just going to send him over, even though he should. It would be a career high payday for Joe Joyce, and Anthony Joshua is so obviously the A-side to him, but Frank wouldn't make things easy. He'd want in on that action. So don't even waste your time. A recurring theme in Anthony Joshua's career many years ago when he was first entering into negotiations with Deontay Wilder, Deontay oh. wasted his time. He did. That whole bit about Deontay Wilder's $50 million email, that blows over, and Deontay eventually tells the media he has accepted Anthony Joshua's terms for a deal. Yeah. He receives a contract, and this was after after their negotiations had dragged on for months. This was after both Povetkin, his promoter Ryabinski, and the WBA agreed to stand down and let those two boys negotiate. He receives a contract from Matchroom, sits on the contract for a little over a week's time. The WBA finally has enough. They were on the clock. 
Wilder was taking his time, wasting Anthony Joshua's and the WBA under pressure from Alexander Povetkin and his promoter. They'd had enough. They waited long enough. They ordered him to fight Alexander Povetkin. Deontay Wilder wasted Anthony Joshua's time, as did Tyson Fury more than once. Their felt talks, their felt set of negotiations. I've no doubts that if he tried to fight Joe Joyce this summer, Frank Warren would make this a long and drug out set of negotiations where it should not be because Joe Joyce is not in the same stratosphere as Anthony in terms of marquee value. You want to do the fight, you send that guy over. And it's as simple as that. It should be, but it wouldn't and it could, in theory, turn out to be a massive waste of time. And Anthony don't need to waste no more time on these politics and this kind of stuff. You need to fight in the fights that you can have in a timely fashion. Otto Valin is one among them. Philippe Hergovic, the IBF's mandatory challenger. Sinaba, those are all doable fights. It wouldn't be hard to make. Eddie Hearn was quoted as saying, I believe he, he being Anthony Joshua, is going to be in better shape in December, mentally and physically, for the Furies and the Wilders. But it's going to be very tempting if those fights can get made to not jump straight in. Don't waste your time. Anthony Joshua's a younger fighter than Tyson Fury. He's a younger fighter than Deontay Wilder. He needs to use his time wisely because he's got more of it than they do. Eddie Hearn places far too much emphasis on Anthony consistently participating in big fights, big, big fights, while Tyson Fury marches to the beat of his own drum, has no issue. Neither Deontay Wilder or Tyson Fury have any issues, any aversions to messing up a big fight. Consider that Wilder prioritized the Fury fight over Undisputed years ago, years later. After Anthony knocked out Kubrat Pulev and he started talks with Tyson Fury, they almost got the fight over the line until the mediation arbitration situation reared its ugly head and Tyson Fury had to skip out on Anthony. How he handled this latest set of negotiations with Oleksandr Usyk for Undisputed. May have been Team Usyk that pulled the plug on the fight, but that's after Tyson Fury made things difficult, very difficult, so much so. They pulled the plug. These guys kill big fights with impunity, marching to the beat of their own drum. Thus, Eddie Hearn shouldn't place the onus at the feet of Anthony Joshua to be the only one trying to deliver this division big fights. If he needs time, you give him that. And he so obviously does. He's breaking in a new trainer. This is the first victory he's had. Before this, he hadn't won a fight since late 2020. Two years. So let the man ease himself into activity without the burden of targeting a big fight. And just in keeping with the theme of big fights, what would be big fights, and attempting to get them over the line, per a tweet from Michael Benson, Errol Spence versus Terence Crawford for the undisputed welterweight world title is reportedly now set for June 17th in Las Vegas. It's claimed the official announcement is expected at the Javante Davis versus Ryan Garcia fight on April 22nd later on this month. This isn't really new news. This has been the story for some days, and... Maybe a little over a week now? Just about, yeah. We talked about it here on the channel 11 days ago. Rumors and speculations circling around the boxing cosmos about the potential matchup this past weekend. Though in truth, if the rumors, the gossips, don't have much traction, it's because people don't want to get their hopes up. They'll believe it when they see it. I think a lot of fans on both sides of this argument... They're all puckered out arguing about these two guys. I mean, seriously, it's been, what, four or five years? There's not much more to say. There's not much more to argue about. And nobody's budging. Though I do think we might actually get the fight this time because, in case you're not aware, Showtime has been allowed a grace period. Showtime boxing, I should say those in a higher tax bracket than Stefan Espinoza. They're giving him a grace period, a window, approximately two-year window. It's been a question hovering over Showtime's boxing programming as to how long it's going to last. How long will it continue as Showtime is in the process of being absorbed by Paramount Plus, Paramount, their parent company. For years now, people have speculated that Boxing on Showtime might go the same way that boxing on HBO went. We all know what happened with HBO. They left the sport years ago. Years later, many industry insiders and spectators in what is this spectator sport speculated that might be the same thing with Showtime. And when you see what's going on with Showtime and their parent company, reports indicating that boxing, boxing isn't going anywhere at the moment. Not at least for the next 
year or so close to two how does this pertain to crawford versus spence you ask well this is showtime's opportunity their window of opportunity to shell out the best boxing content they can to thereby elicit the best reaction the best metrics the best viewing figures in order to justify why showtime as a platform should stay in the business of boxing they've managed to get davis versus garcia over the line that's a big fight in and of itself it is and if they can get this one over the line as well well that's two big fights two good fights one of the few good fights they can put together one of the few big ones though how big is the question is crawford versus spence a big enough fight that it can get showtime out of hot water showtime boxing i should say this isn't bad news you know i mean i'd still pay to see terence crawford knock out errol spence jr i haven't changed my mind about that as far as how that fight would go i'd still pay to see it I think you guys would too. So addressing the realities and varying grotesqueries of Showtime Boxing's current situation, you do have to wonder if staging Davis versus Garcia and Crawford versus Spence, yeah. putting on these fights. Could that save Showtime Boxing? Seems a presumptuous presupposition. In any event, we might actually get the fight this time. We might. And if we do, I still favor Terrence Crawford to win it. Terrence, who's some years older than Errol Spence Jr., albeit more active. Terrence Crawford got a lot of guff for taking on David Avanesian late last year, but that was a blessing in disguise because what that essentially allowed him to do was have a maintenance fight. Oh. He has seen action in the last 12 months. Errol Spence Jr. He ain't fought since April of last year. If this news checks out and he's set to return in June opposite the ring Terrence, it will be well over a year's time since he had a fight. Only one fight last year? No fights the year before that. I've always favored Terrence Crawford to beat Errol Spence Jr. stylistically. I always have, but when you tack on Errol's sparse schedule of activity, I mean, none of the welterweights are really all that active. Errol Spence Jr. is still less active than Terrence Crawford. He's less active than he is. The only welterweight out there less active than Errol is Keith Thurman. These fighters seem quasi-retired to me. Errol Spence Jr., Keith Thurman, whereas Terrence Crawford, he is a gym rat. He is a gym nut. He's always in the gym. I don't think he's struggling anywhere near as much to make welterweight as Errol Spence Jr. might be. I mean, how many years has he spent at that weight? Remember, they were supposed to be doing a Thurman fight at Junior Middle. Those reports further indication that making 147 ain't easy anymore, not for Errol. I still favor Terrence to win it. What more can I say? Make the fight.